Hey, what's up, Dan? Hey, Dan. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit late. Uh, there was another Zoom meeting uh, that I was in, so. Yeah, no, no worries. Just uh, seeing if I know how to work this. Is um, is my PowerPoint up? Yeah, so I see your PowerPoint. Um, uh, <coughs> and computing. So, hey, so you did your undergrad at, at uh, UT Austin, right? Yeah. Then you came here, did your PhD at UT Austin, and then you went to McGill, and then MIT. <laughs> no, I saw that in your email, uh, the University of Waterloo. Okay. So, oh, so not, so not, what was it? Why was I thinking McGill? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's also in Canada, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I know what it was. I wrote someone a letter of recommendation from McGill recently. And so, <laughs> okay. Okay, so anyway, University of Waterloo, so good. And then basically uh, Lincoln Lab at MIT, and then now you're at uh, Lawrence Livermore, right? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. All right, onward. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dan uh, um, back to give a colloquium. So he, he did his undergraduate at UT Austin, did his master's degree here. Actually, before that, he uh, did a stint in the Peace Corps in Africa, right? Yeah, that's correct. In, in Malawi, so. Yeah, good memory. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, then after uh, here, he got his uh, PhD at UT Austin, uh, then did postdocs at University of Waterloo and at MIT's Lincoln Lab and now is currently at Lawrence Livermore Lab working on actually quantum computing uh, stuff, which is really cool and which he's gonna tell us about. So Dan, take it away. Yeah, thanks, Doug. <clears throat> um, it's really great to be back in this good company, uh, even if we are in a bit of distance. So uh, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Is that, is that up? And is, are these, you know, are, is my face and Doug's face also on the screen or is that a separate thing that only I can see? No, you look fine, Dan. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'll just hop into We don't it, need to see Doug's face. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, so I'm gonna talk uh, uh, about work I was doing uh, when I was employed at the University of Waterloo, but uh, actually I was stationed uh, just outside of uh, Boston at MIT Lincoln Labs, working under this uh, IARPA project, uh, the Quantum Enhanced Optimization, where we were uh, really kind of like sussing out the possibility of using superconducting flux qubits as a quantum annealing processor hardware. So in, in particular, as kind of a subpart of that, of that project, uh, what we were doing in particular was uh, engineering ways um, for long distance uh, qubit interactions um, between qubits on, 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 on these chips. So I have up here a picture of the US and it's kind of drawn in, 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 in a funny way. <clears throat> um, but I want to illustrate maybe one of the problems that, that quantum computing is trying to is trying to take a stab at. And this is this kind of famous traveling salesman problem where, you know, if you start at some city in, in, in the United States, um, you know, what's the best path to take such that you hit every city, never repeating uh, and return to your starting point. So as you can tell, this is, this is kind of a difficult problem because um, as the number of cities scales linearly, the number of possible paths scales ex exponentially. And you know, pretty soon you have so many possible paths that it's, it's actually kind of difficult for a, a classical computer to, to take, take stock of it. Um, another kind of thing you could kind of look at really quickly, you can see that most of the paths are not going to be anywhere near uh, the ground state of this system. For example, if you hop from San Francisco to Chicago to Florida and back, that's certainly not the way to do it. You want to kind of like go along a nearest neighbor kind of kind of path. <clears throat> um, you can also see, which makes this uh, kind of a, also another reason this is a difficult problem, 
is that you can see that vastly different paths, let's say if you cut through the Southwest and then go through Florida, it, the path is gonna look really different than if you kind of go through the Northwest and through Idaho and stuff like that. But uh, at the end of the trip, maybe they're both gonna be kind of near the minimum, dis the true minimum distance trip. So there's many different kind of local minima that, that might be a possible candidate solution and kind of sifting through those is, is another reason that this, this problem is, is pretty hard. Okay, uh, so the contents of this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about quantum computing. I guess I've just kind of gone over one of the whys, uh, like what types of problems we're, we're trying to tackle. Um, how are we gonna tackle these problems? Uh, basically using quantum properties like superposition, interference, and, and entanglement as a, as a computational resource. Uh, quantum annealing is, is a variant of quantum computing that is uh, gaining some interest uh, currently, <clears throat> as there's, there's some reasons to believe that it's, it's moderately insensitive to decoherence effects. So, so in this near term, kind of pre-error error, error correction uh, era that, that in quantum computing that we're in, this might be uh, a really useful um, protocol. The uh, really difficult question is how in the world would you build one of these machines? And there, there's a, a number of different hardwares. Doug and I were, were discussing some of these different hardwares uh, before the talk. Um, and it's really kind of interesting, different kind of like takes that, that people are, are, are pursuing right now. So as I mentioned, we uh, in particular uh, with superconducting qubits uh, for quantum annealing, we're, we're interested in designing long distance interactions. So as these devices get bigger and bigger in the number of qubits, uh, the qubits themselves become more distantly located. And we really want every qubit to be able to talk to every other one. And so we need some kind of way to, uh, or, or medium to act as a conduit for that interaction. Uh, so at the end, I'll, I'll kind of uh, give kind of an outlook on the field and uh, maybe a bit of a sales pitch to, to students who might be interested in this kind of work. Okay, why uh, quantum computing? Uh, or what type of types of problems um, that a quantum computer might be able to solve that a classical computer wouldn't. In this one example of the traveling salesman, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of return to that through, throughout the talk. But you can see uh, basically any problem where uh, the number of possible solutions grows exponentially with the size of the problem. Uh, classical computers have a really difficult time um, computing that. So the initial breakthroughs, uh, two, two big ones that, that I want to mention, uh, one, the Grover algorithm, uh, which is finding an element in an unsorted database. Uh, you can imagine, you know, putting a card of deck uh, uh, or a deck of cards face down and you want to pick the seven of clubs. Um, in general, it's going to take you, on, on average, it's going to take you 26 tries to, to find that card. Um, but uh, through, through this quantum algorithm, uh, this Grover algorithm, you can do that in, in the square root of, of 52 as opposed to linearly in 52, which is, which is a speed up. Uh, this paper by Shore, I believe it was in 94, 95, uh, about a method to <clears throat> tell if a very large number was prime or not, caught uh, the attention of a lot of people. And that was kind of a big, the first big kind of like famous result in this field and people have been uh, very seriously pursuing quantum mechanics or quantum computing ever since. Uh, optimization problems, like I mentioned before, you can, you know, the traveling salesman is, is, is a problem, but you can see pretty clearly how that would generalize to a number of kind of industrial applications where there's a large number of moving parts and you want to find the most optimum way of, of uh, solving some task, like how do we get all of the people and goods in the United States where they want to be in a given single day that kind of like makes everybody the most happy. Um, <clears throat> what we'll see is that actually these optimization problems uh, can be written as a Hamiltonian of a spin glass mag magnetic system. 
<clears throat> so there's a real connection between uh, these difficult co computational problems and uh, actual, actual physical systems. <clears throat> there is, uh, for, for a long time, you know, it was quantum computing was seen as kind of a pie in the sky <clears throat> type of type of possibility, but really in the last five years, that's that's kind of turned turn the corner, and there's a, certainly immediate economic benefit to be had by by these machines. Uh, for example, quantum simulation. I think Google's last paper was a uh, quantum si simulation. I can't quite remember what they were looking at, but. Um, Obviously, the pharmaceutical industry is very in interested in this. Uh, people making next generation batteries who want to know what kind of catalyst they're going to use. Uh, even people making fertilizer. You know, they're, 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 there's, there's not a really good way uh, as of yet to model kind of like mesoscopic molecules. Uh, so quantum computing actually offers a, kind of an, an, an immediate uh, pathway forward there. Quantum assisted optimization, I've just kind of mentioned like this traveling salesman problem and, and other uh, kind of industrial applications that go along with that. Uh, and then also uh, kind of like quantum sampling and um, data usage. So quantum machine learning is, is becoming very popular uh, research topic. And then uh, kind of like graph or, or, or really data partitioning. And this is why companies like Google, for example, that generate large amount of data and like have to like go through that data in some, some useful way uh, would want to know how to kind of like separate it, analyze it, and then use, use the results to, to do something. Yay. Uh, these, these quantum processors are made out of qubits and the interactions between them. You can think of a qubit as, as anything that behaves like a stationary spin one half particle. So it behaves like an electron or, or, or a proton. Um, and uh, the spin one or the spin up and the spin down are what's known as the computational states. Uh, at the end of uh, the calculation, we'll read out some binary uh, bit string, uh, which will be represented by spin up and spin down. And that, that, that's, that will translate to the answer to the problem that we're, that we're trying to solve. So we can do kind of kind of two things with these qubits. So we could apply local magnetic fields to make up or down more, more probable or induce some ro rotation. And then also uh, we need to be able to engineer tunable, uh, either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic uh, interactions between these qubits. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, quantum annealing is uh, a type of quantum uh, computation. And it, coming from a material science background, this is uh, appealing and, and it makes a certain amount of sense to me. Uh, so, so let's say we have a difficult optimization problem like this, this traveling salesman problem. We can always write a cost function for that for that problem. Like for example, these spins, SI and SJ, will represent different cities and uh, the JIJ would be the distance in between these cities. Uh, I, guess, I, I guess the local term would be, I don't know, like if, if like the weather is good or bad in that city or something like that. <laughs> um, but this cost function uh, will probably remind you of a icing spin model. And so this, this cost function can be written as an icing spin model. And, and so what we want to do, if we can find the ground state of that icing spin model, that represents the solution to this difficult optimization problem that, that we started with. Uh, so this reveals this like really interesting connection between um, spin glass physics and, and these difficult computation problems. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so, so now's the, the really hard part. How we just need, so all we need to do is, is build uh, some tunable quantum magnetic system and, and then figure out how to prepare uh, its ground state. Okay, so, so let's say for now that, that, that we can build this thing 
uh, how do we prepare its, its, its ground state? And, and one method for doing that is uh, this adiabatic passage. So if we start uh, with a strong transverse field, let's say along, along the x direction, um, the ground state of our system will be this product state of uh, each qubit in um, a superposition of up and down. And let's say there, there's no interactions between qubits at this point. So what, so what we can do, we can decrease the strength of that transverse field while increasing the strength of the Hamiltonian that describes our, our complicated uh, optimization problem. And if we do this in an adiabatic fashion, we should arrive at the ground state of our uh, complicated problem, Hamiltonian. Uh, you can see kind of, kind of right away that this is uh, in, an interesting process uh, and that the nature of the ground state kind of initially and finally are, are very different. And that's a clue that this is, um, this is indicative of some quantum phase transition that we're driving our magnetic system through. So, so with every, every quantum phase transition, uh, there's, there's a minimum gap associated uh, with that. And so for, for six, a, a successful um, application of this, of this method, we need to drive the system you know, not so fast um, so that we stay in the adiabatic limit and we don't induce uh, like landau zener type transitions between the ground and the, and the excited state, but then also not, not so slow. Uh, so for example, our, our temperature might be the same, you know, about the same energy of this gap. And if we go too slow, uh, we'll just thermalize out of, out, of the ground, out of the ground state while we're making this passage. So uh, we need to we need to think about how this uh, minimum gap is going to scale with with system size, and it does so uh, differently depending on what kind of phase transition we're we're going through. For a force for a first order phase transition, that gap uh, will decrease exponentially in the in the system size, and that's no good. Uh, so we want to be able to engineer uh, a second order quantum phase transition such that that gap only closes polynomially. Um, okay, so now, now that we have a, a, a collection of, of qubits um, and the coupling in between them, there's been a few different ideas about how to arrange them. Um, so D-Wave is, is this company, I think in British Columbia, and they've been real uh, pioneers of this, of this uh, method. And they have uh, kind of an interesting design where they have kind of a unit cell where the qubits are uh, highly connected to one another. And then they're sparsely connected to, to neighboring um, unit, unit cells. Uh, the quantum optimization um, project that I'm working with is looking at building devices kind of with just uh, nearest neighbor type interactions with much uh, a smaller number of, 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 of qubits. And these, and, and you know, you could, you could really do a lot with, with these, but uh, it's not ideal because what you, what you really want is all to all connectivity. Uh, so, so again, with the, with the traveling salesman problem, there's a distance between every pair of cities. And so you want to be able to encode that into your magnetic system. And obviously there's not all to all connectivity here or, or here. So um, what, we're, what we're envisioning as, as kind of like a next generation type, type processor, at least for a moderate number of, of qubits, is if we arrange the qubits kind of on the perimeter of um, uh, kind of like a spin network, so this will be like the medium where we can propagate a signal from one qubit to another. And through tuning, we could induce an interaction between any pair of these, of these qubits. Um, <clears throat> so we want to develop uh, these highly connective, um, highly coherent or 
uh, long distance also. And um, when we turn on these interactions, we don't want to destroy the, the, the coherence of these, of these uh, qubits. So these are all um, considerations we want to be thinking about as we're trying to figure out how to, how to build this thing. OK. Uh, yeah, so, like, I, was, I was talking to Doug about some of the, these different um, hardwares for, for building the, these machines. And there's a lot of very interesting ideas. Uh, I would say uh, we're still in the kind of vacuum tube era of quantum computing, if not even before that. Uh, so we're, there, there's a lot of candidate hardware platforms to build qubits and the interactions between them out of. Um, yeah, so, so actually like the first physical quantum computer was just uh, doing NMR of, of liquids and people were able to factor very small numbers, uh, which is kind of interesting. The fields kind of moved away from NMR of liquids and moved on to NMR of solids, in particular, uh, these nitrogen vacancy centers and diamonds is a, is a particularly attractive uh, venue for this type of computation. Also, uh, semiconducting quantum dots. So you can make these um, semiconducting uh, structures uh, quite, quite small. So electrons in them kind of behave like a particle in a box and the different energy levels correspond to the different qubit states and things like that. Also, uh, cold atoms are uh, uh, very uh, vigorous um, research direction right now. Honeywell's new computer is, is a computer built out of, out of cold atoms. Uh, they're also photonic systems. Uh, but the, but the, 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 the platform that we're gonna be working with and, and what this project was based on is uh, superinducting Josephson circuits. And, and these are, these, these are kind of nice. Um, this is probably not going to be, you know, what a quantum computer is in 50 years, but, but, but for this stage, they're, 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 they're really nice for a few reasons. And uh, one of them, for example, like people know how to make circuits out of these well-established fabrication um, techniques. Uh, you can kind of make these circuits any way you want. So, so they're, uh, they're very tailorable to, to you know, what, what behavior you, you, you want out of them. That, that tailorability uh, does become, become a problem because they are more susceptible to fabrication, mistakes, imperfections, things like that. But, um, but, they're, but they're kind of like the main um, hardware platform for, for quantum computing right now. So in particular, there's a, there, there's a number of different circuits that people use as, as qubits. In this project, we were using these tunable flux qubits. Uh, and the zero and the one state are encoded into um, either a clockwise or a counterclockwise current um, of, these, of these circuits. Uh, the energy diagram for, uh, or the potential energy of this circuit is on the bottom right, and it's, it's a double well potential where one well represents uh, the clockwise circulating and the other well represents uh, the counterclockwise cir um, current circulating. And uh, so we could put a magnetic flux into the main loop, and that controls kind of like the tilt which direction is, is favorable. And, or we can put magnetic flux into the smaller loop and that controls uh, the tunneling rate uh, between, the two, between the two states. So we have a lot of control over, over, over this device. And in kind of just like an intuitive sense, it, 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 at least to me, it makes, it makes sense um, that this is kind of like a spin one half particle, the spin up and spin down as, as it actually possesses a magnetic moment. <clears throat> All right, so we need to induce um, coupling between these two qubits. And we actually do that by using a very similar uh, circuit. Instead of operating this, this circuit in the kind of flux qubit regime with this double well, we instead um, adjust this barrier to be uh, quite small such that any small tilt uh, we give um, to 
uh, or apply to the main loop of the circuit causes the, the, the wave function to kind of slosh quite easily from one side of this uh, potential well to the other. And so we, we define that actually as the, as the, the, the ability to, to do that as the susceptibility of this coupler, uh, basically some small change in flux uh, can induce a large change in current in this. And then all of these circuits are uh, inductively coupled and that's, and that's how that, that interaction um, happens. So that, that susceptibility goes into uh, the strength of the cubic cubic interaction, uh, which enters um, the Hamiltonian describing this system. Uh, shown in the bottom right is uh, some simulations showing um, the strength of the coupling we expect out of our devices. And this is kind of showing that coupling in, in qubit spectroscopy uh, in, in this previous paper that we, that we base a, a lot of our work on. Okay, so now we have um, qubits, couplers. Uh, we need to be able to measure them. And these experiments are typically done by probing uh, or sending some probe tone down a feed line and having that probe tone interact with, with a resonator. Um, the behavior of that resonator can tell us <clears throat> um, information about the qubit and, and, and the couplers too. Uh, and, and for this particular design, which, which, which we're kind of prou proud of, uh, we're, we're sensitive to both uh, the energy levels of the qubits through a dispersive interaction, uh, as well as the, as the current states um, in, uh, and when, when operating these resonators in, in a flux sensitive mode. We fabricate uh, the qubits, the couplers, and the resonators uh, on these uh, chips that are a few millimeters squared. And another <clears throat> kind of a technological breakthrough or kind of an advancement that, that we've made recently is, is as these devices get bigger, you know, more than just two or three qubits on them, uh, running all of these control lines becomes uh, prohibitive. So what we've done here is we've, we've placed the qubits, the resonators, uh, the couplers on one tier, and then placed all the control lines on an on a opposite tier. And then we just kind of sandwich them, them together. Uh, this kind of frees up um, space on the, on the chip. Um, making way for, for, for larger devices. Uh, after these are sandwiched together, we place them in a, uh, what's called a device package. So that's the device is actually sitting in the center of this and we can run uh, DC control lines controlling the flux in the, in the qubits, as well as microwave lines um, going through uh, the feed line and also for qubit excitation pulses. Uh, then we take that package and we uh, place it in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator. This is actually a picture of our, of, of our lab at, at Lincoln Labs. And this is the fridge I was working on in the, in the back here. These are, these are fascinating machines in their, in, in their, in their own right. Um, we thermally anchor our packages to this bottom uh, kind of arm here. And then once we <clears throat> have connected all the control lines that go to the top of the fridge, uh, we have one can that goes over here and creates an inner vacuum chamber. We have a second set of cans, which are shown here in this fridge that's all buttoned up. Uh, basically that just creates like a vacuum sleeve. So the room temperature can't really see the inner vacuum chamber. In that inner vacuum chamber, um, we actually fill it with helium gas and then pump on it um, kind of strongly to get the temperature actually down to about one Kelvin. Once it's down to one Kelvin, we then circulate a mix of helium three and helium four kind of down and then it, it collects in, in what's basically a still. Uh, helium's fascinating and um, what it, what it does is like this mixture of these, of these two isotopes 
actually undergoes this endothermic reaction where, where it separates into two phase, phases, uh, one helium-3 rich and one helium-4 rich. And to do that, uh, it basically like sucks all the heat energy out of the surrounding metal uh, to create that domain. And that causes the metal around it uh, to drop down to, to the tens of millikelvin. Um, which is really, yeah, yeah, kind of like so some really interesting physics there. And it's just, it's just becoming like this, this technology is really just becoming available to a broader research community um, so that you, you don't have to be a helium physicist to, to run one of these. And that's just really happened in the last like 10 years, which is opening up a lot of possibility for, for research. Uh, this is a typical kind of like wiring setup uh, for our experiment. Uh, for example, I think this picture here was taken with the vector network analyzer. Oops. Uh, this guy here. So we'll send down a probe tone at a certain frequency. It'll get attenuated and filtered as we go down, down the stages. Uh, it will either, it'll go through a feed line uh, next to one of these resonators and interact with it, and then back up through a series of filters, isolators, uh, amplifiers, and then back in, and we can measure basically like the, the strength of the, of the transmitted signal. <clears throat> okay, so, so now, now that we have kind of a picture of what these devices look like, um, remember what, what, we're, what we're trying to do. So we want to, um, you know, we want to kind of like see if this is making a, a device like this is even possible. So what we did is we uh, designed and fabricated uh, some of the building blocks that would go uh, eventually into, into this larger um, kind of like spin network. Uh, so, so in particular, uh, most of the experiments we've done uh, for this paper were done on this long chain. So we want to make sure, you know, we have the, the ability for, for long range interactions between qubits. Uh, this device here is to test uh, the coherence properties of a, of a qubit when it's kind of enmeshed in this, in this spin network. And uh, this last device is <clears throat> really to test out the possibility of higher uh, connective um, interactions between, between qubits. Can we branch out signals um, su successfully and still have them um, have these qubits talk to one another? All right. Uh, so taking a closer look at this, uh, what we call the coupler chain, uh, device. Uh, Arrhenius just refers to the to the mask. Um, so this is our fifth kind of set of, of devices in our in our fabrication process. This is basically a CAD picture of uh, the interposer tier. So this will be on top of the of the qubits, but you can see like where they would be on the opposite qubit tier. Uh, you can see coming from the bottom that we have all of the bias line controls. So we want to be able to send some small current through these lines to provide flux for the different uh, loops in the qubit, the resonator, and the couplers. You can also see uh, the resonators kind of extending um, away from the chip. So they're basically like these long, like meandering resonators here. And then uh, the feed line coming from 36 and then wrapping around. Uh, so this is uh, when, 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 when we fabricated this, this was one of the biggest devices to come out of the, out of the program. Uh, so nine units, two flux qubits and seven couplers, uh, each one having its own readout. So there's 27 loops uh, and 27 bias lines, which uh, actually, made calibrating the device uh, quite difficult. And, and you can kind of see why uh, with this little cartoon uh, up here. So, so each loop, so this is one of the qubits, and this is its resonator. 
uh, the qubit has an X loop and it has a dedicated bias line that we can run a current down. That current produces a magnetic field, which feeds into a flux into that loop. Uh, but uh, it also contaminates the adjacent loops and not just on the same qubit, but also on the qubits and couplers next to it. So um, we had to find <laughs> basically this 27 by 27 matrix that provides the linear transformation between the currents that we send down to the device and the actual fluxes uh, that uh, we're targeting in this, in this device. Uh, also, every time we, we cool down, uh, basically some random amount of flux is just trapped uh, in, in the circuit um, so, so, so to do this, uh, we had to develop automated methods uh, and that, that, that were scalable to, to other devices and even, even larger devices than, than this. So we had, to, we had to actually hit and look and um, we dealt with a kind of a, a lot of uh, like computer vision packages that, that, that Python um, has as kind of standard libra libraries. And most of the work actually on this device was, was spent um, calibrating it. So it was, it was no small um, task. Uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, I do have some slides. Maybe we can talk about it after the uh, talk here. Okay. Uh, so we want to uh, remember the main, the main point of this is to test if we can really induce these long range interactions along this uh, seven unit coupler chain. So the first, the first step in that is, uh, you know, can we can we send a flux signal along along this chain? So uh, either using uh, you know coupler seven <clears throat> or qubit two, you know, we can um, place, for example, uh, qubit two in its left current state, and then tilt it so it turns into its right qubit or right current state. And that induces a change in flux in coupler seven. And the question is, can we tune these couplers so that that change in flux propagates along the other, along the entire chain and is uh, detected by qubit one? Uh, it turns out uh, we, we can do this. So um, what we did is using both uh, an experiment just with the couplers, so tuning the qubits to some high frequency point and uh, not letting them interact, as well as uh, using the entire device, uh, so using one of the end qubits as the source uh, and the eventual target. Shown here is the amount of, uh, or the change in flux each unit uh, experienced um, when we switched our source unit from, from left to right current state. And we see uh, for, and this is for each um, coupler tuned uniformly. And all we've done is uh, uniformly change the tunneling rate for the flux in the X loop uh, from kind of a parabolic potential to uh, this, this cortic potential. And we see for uh, relatively larger values uh, that this flux signal uh, decays after a few units. Uh, but around uh, 0.15 uh, phi naught or in units of magnetic flux quanta, we actually see the chain um, support long range interactions uh, Throughout throughout the device, uh, it was really we we were also able to do um, simulations of of this of this device, and it was quite quite gratifying to see uh, our experimental and, and and our simulated results uh, really match up. It was uh, it gave us um, a real real belief that we have uh, an accurate control of the device as well as um, a good theoretical understanding. So we now, given that we can, given that we can induce this this long range interaction, we want to be able to 
quantify it. So like, what does that mean? What does that, that, that flux propagation mean in terms of basically the value of this spin uh, interaction term? So we had, we had two, two methods of, of, of looking at this. Uh, again, we were, one of them was looking at uh, a simulation of this, of this system. So we placed in, in the simulation uh, the two qubits at uh, degenerate energy spacings. And as we lowered, um, again, the X flux uh, in each coupler unit uniformly, to its coupling state, we see a splitting in uh, the two previously degenerate qubit states. That splitting is uh, proportional to the coupling between those two, two qubits. And then that's, that's one way of uh, pulling out this, this, this value. Uh, the other way is through our coupler chain uh, flux propagation experiment where we measured the change in coupler one's effective Z flux with respect to uh, the source cube, the source coupler, coupler seven. So again, for um, kind of uh, large values of the coupler's X flux, we don't see any response at all. This line is just flat. But as we enter the coupled state, we start to see um, an induced change in, in qubit one's Z flux that pulling out uh, the slope of this using these other values that we already know, we can predict what that, what that coupling strength uh, will be. And again, it was, it, it was quite gratifying to see that, that, that these two methods actually do agree, um, not uh, exactly, but, um, but, but qualitatively strongly. Um, yeah, so this was uh, the work we've done uh, in, in demonstrating this th this long range interaction between these two qubits and in this device that we've that that we've fabricated, and um, this was yeah th this was a, a, a really big a really big step for us and in, in kind of the direction of of this future um, possible possible device. <clears throat> um, so just just doing the the, the calibration was. Uh, quite a bit of work, but I think the work that we've done there uh, is easily transferable to other similar devices, like the other ones that we had had fabricated, and and also scalable. So as these these devices get get bigger and bigger, we can you know kind of hit hit play on this um, uh, procedure and 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 extract that that complicated flux to current conversion matrix. Uh, we were able to demonstrate long-range coupling um, through this spin chain. And um, the fact that it agrees with our simulation so well really suggests that we have a, a, a strong control over our system and, and, and suggests that, that also that we've kind of produced this, this entangled um, chain state, which is, which is really what we're looking for. Uh, there, there's another group at, at MIT Lincoln Labs that's kind of working in, in, in parallel to us, you know, not, not concentrating on the, on the long range aspect of this, but building kind of like small triangular devices with, you know, a small coupler network in between that they can turn, turn on and off interactions between the, between the vertices of that, of that triangle. So, um, Hopefully soon, uh, maybe with like the next round of, of, of funding for, for this project, we can start, kind of start to put these ideas together uh, to make us a, a slightly larger device. Um, there, are, there are a few other things we do want to do with this, with this coupler chain though. Um, for example, I showed a simulation of that qubit line splitting. Um, it would be actually really good to see that actually in, in, the, in the actual experiment. So that's, that's an important step to be done uh, before going too much further. Also, um, we believe, there's reason to believe that uh, the qubit's coherence won't be affected too, too much if we stay in a particular um, 
operation, flux op operation regime. Uh, but you know, it, though, those measurements really need to be taken. So doing um, energy relaxation decays, Ramsey type measurements, spin echo type measurements of the qubit while it's enmeshed in this in the spin network is, is, is an important step uh, before going too much further. Uh, we would like to do also just two qubit annealing experiments. So this is this is for an annealing a quantum annealing processor. So we would like to at least see like a two qubit um, uh, annealing experiment with the interaction mediated by that by that chain. And then, um, and then also like I'm kind of yeah I'm coming kind of from a, a material science background, so I, you know the first thing when we when we have some some system is is we want to do um, we want to do susceptibility measurement. So like what what would a suscept like an AC susceptibility measurement uh, of this chain look like? We've we've basically done a DC susceptibility measurements by imparting. This small, this small flux, and then watching the response of the chain. But moving on into um, the frequency domain, I think would also, also be very interesting. Okay, there's uh, just um, kind of like a few directions where uh, quantum annealing is, is going. And so these are some other projects uh, under the auspices of this QEO, QEO project. Um, you know the only types of interactions that that I've shown here are are of the ZZ type. Um, it would be really useful if we could engineer also, for example, XX interactions between these two qubits. Um, and this is this this is uh, probably crucial in kind of changing this quantum phase transition that I mentioned earlier from from our first order to a second order phase transition. Uh, these XX terms are also necessary for, for error correction, correcting devices. And um, so there's some, some really interesting uh, work done in, in designing these. And uh, what, what are these qubits going to, going to look like? And um, basically they use uh, the Aronoff Kasher effect, kind of like the electric analog of the Aronoff Bohm effect to provide this extra degree of freedom uh, necessary for, for that. Uh, there's also the idea of, uh, so what, but, but it turns out this is really hard to make and, 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 and we're, having, we're having a lot of trouble with that. Uh, there's another idea of kind of escaping this, this small gap problem. <clears throat> and that's actually, actually using diabetic transitions. So what if we, so, so the, the whole name of the game is preparing the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, with high fidelity as quick as possible. And um, doing it adiabatically is, is, is one possibility, but what if we actually use the interference between the ground and the excited state to uh, prepare the ground state uh, with, with, with high fidelity faster? So it, it turns out that we could, there's, there's theoretical uh, reasons that we could kind of induce coherent oscillations in the ground state pop population by actually utilizing transitions between the ground and the, and, and the first excited state. So that's another uh, kind of research direction uh, that quantum annealing and this QBO project in particular are, are taking. Um, so yeah, in, in, in conclusion, um, this quantum annealing holds a promise for these near-term uh, pre-fault tolerant quantum processors. Um, we've demonstrated uh, the possibility of long range interactions in, in this device that, that we've made. And uh, yeah, kind of as, as, as a pitch to, to students, I think this is, uh, this quantum information science is a really exciting um, kind of field of research to be uh, working in now. And it, it, it just combines a lot of kind of like sub-disciplines within, within physics. You know, we're thinking about uh, material science problems, uh, like, like what do we make these circuits out of? Uh, how, do we, how do we engineer their kind of like nuts and bolts kind of properties to get the behavior that, that, that we want? Um, there's obviously quantum physics. Uh, there's a lot of microwave engineering goes into like what kind of signals are we sending down? Um, you know, how do we process those? 
Uh, there's a lot of computer science problems. Like what, what type of problems are, are we uh, even trying to solve? And, and you know, what problems do we really want to attack that are difficult for classical computers, but, but machines like this might hold some, some path forward. Um, there's also the, yeah, nonlinear and, and quantum optics. So for example, basically what, we're, what we've dealt with is we built kind of like a cavity QED type of, type of system uh, but instead of you know actual atoms, we have these artificial atoms that that are are qubits. Um, so people are experimenting a lot with things like squeezed states, non-classical um, electromagnetic configurations, uh, and yeah, there, there, there's, there's a lot of interesting work work being done there. And then and then kind of finally, yeah, it's it, it's it's kind of like a, a, a unique spot to to work in. Um, because in, on one hand, we're really addressing uh, some fundamental scientific questions, uh, but at the same time, also, you know, like like making something that's that's going to be used and and you know could, could prove to be a really interesting tool um, for humans in 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 the next few years. So. Uh, yeah, I just need to thank, um, this is just a small uh, subsection of the people on this QEO team, but this is kind of who, who I, I would be, I was, I was working with on a regular basis. So I just need, none of this would be possible without them. And um, emphasize that this was, yeah, a highly collaborative project. This is probably the most people I've ever worked with at one time, and there were a lot of moving parts. and. It was it was quite um, a joy to work with such a talented group of, uh, of of people on this on this project. So, I think I'll stop there and and take any questions if there if there are any. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Dan. And I should let me find the reaction button. Okay. There you go. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Any questions for Dan? So, okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, so you've talked about like, so quantum computers hold the promise to uh, solve some unsolved problems, right? So like like big problems that classical computers can't solve. Uh, so now I, I don't know if, if you know at this, but like one of the, the big sort of unsolved problems is how, how to deal with uh, the strong interaction, basically how, how to solve uh, chromodynamics. And there's, a, there's an ask and people sort of long ago gave up trying to solve it analytically or, or even semi-analytically. And there's this whole discipline called lattice QCD where you basically throw the strong interaction on a lattice and let the computer grind on it. But that hasn't worked too well because again, it's mostly classical computers. So have you heard anything that you know lattice QCD people are excited about what you guys are doing because it might offer them like a more powerful tool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, not, you know, in particular Lattice QCD people, but um, right, right. The, the, the reason, the reason the, these, the, these systems are, are hard to simulate is that you're dealing with highly entangled states where there's kind of an exponentially large number of, of variables to kind of keep, keep track of. And, and, and those are the problems Really, in 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 particular, um, that that was uh, actually one of the first motivations for for quantum computing. I think Feynman gave a talk in like 1982, kind of specifically addressing the fact that these quantum systems are uh, very difficult for for computers to to to, to handle, and um, that yeah, that is one of the main motivations. I haven't heard uh, any like I'm, I'm sure there I'm sure there is work. It's it's a really a large field at this point. Uh, I haven't heard of anything dealing specifically with uh, QCD problems, um, but I am sure people are looking at that. Okay, don't be shy. Uh, feel free to ask Dan questions. Okay, Dan, here's a question. Um, is how, how do you guys, can you actually quantify the amount of decoherence that you have in the devices? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, so at this stage in quantum computing, that is the main problem uh, that we address. Um, for example, uh, let's see if I, I think I had a picture of this down here somewhere. Yeah, so this is a, this is the results of a, of a single um, qubit anneal, for example, where we go from a strong transverse field <clears throat> to a longitudinal field, and we can basically measure uh, the transition from left to right current state. This, the width of this transition is um, in part a measure of the one over F flux noise that's inherent to these devices. Uh, so, and then this is kind of like the, one of the big uh, bottlenecks for, for achieving greater uh, co coherence times. So the, the, the kind of physical picture right now is that uh, right on the, on the substrate or even in the, in the Josephson junction itself, there are these kind of like fluctuating things that cause tiny uh, changes in fluctuating changes uh, in the flux in that, in that loop. Uh, so it's kind of like the flux in that loop kind of goes on like a, like a random walk almost mm. uh, before you can reset it. And so that changes the frequency of the, of the qubit. Um, it also kind of blurs uh, like what the flux operating point is. And uh, yeah, getting a, getting a handle on uh, like the material origin of, uh, of that noise is the biggest research direction right now. I, I guess my question is, um, can you distinguish between, like you said, random noise that destroys coherence and something that, let's say, makes one of the terms in your superposition just shift the phase slowly in time since you're doing adiabatic things? So now you would still get an error, but that's not uh, that's not noise. It doesn't quite decohere. You still have a uh, right. <sighs> so um, right, if you have like a small phase rotation around the z-axis right. of one of these qubits, um, that would in, in in a sense that 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 is an error. So so for example, what what would cause that? Um, um, that Precession is caused by, for example, like putting a magnetic field along that z direction, right, and having the block vector rotate around it, right. Um, again, that's that's coming from a uh, like a room temperature electronic power source feeding a feeding a current through that bias line and putting some some magnetic flux into into one of those loops, right. So again, you're, you're like that, that change in flux is, is causing that, that change in precession. Okay. Um, and right, yeah. And, and, and so there are kind of two main causes of qubit error. One mm -hmm. is uh, a change in phase around your computational state direction. And then two would be like flipping. So you have some small uh, transverse field that might cause some, some uh, change. And those, yeah, th those, two, those two effects are, are uh, dealt with in, in error correcting devices, which is its own fascinating uh, field. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, the, if, if I remember correctly, you know, one, it's, it's, it's too hard to do now. Mm. It's a, that, that, that's a project that the field in, in general is kind of marching towards. Um, but the idea is we'll be able to encode one logical qubit, which is made up of multiple physical qubits. And if we can prepare a singlet representation of these multiple qubits as one logical, let's say, spin down, it'll be a way of 
these, these, these errors will never take the qubit outside of that space. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's kind of like a degenerate ground state in that, in that singlet. Uh, it's 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 something I've, I've I've read about and I find it really interesting. I've never really had a chance to like work in that in that field, but it's but it's really interesting um, quantum physics. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, is there any reason why you wouldn't go up to higher spins, like uh, you know, not just spin up, spin down, but let's say up, down, sideways? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there, 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 there's a lot of research now, and actually, uh, my job at, at Livermore, we're we're really interested in not just using um, qubits, but rather qubits. Uh -huh. So not just the the ground and the and the first excited state, but also you know the, the next excited state and the and the next excited state. Um, and in and then also you know. Um, so at, 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 at Livermore, we have these devices that are more like, let me see if I can show it here, more like these uh, kind of like transmon type, type devices, which are almost harmonic oscillators. Um, but they have just enough anharmicity that you can distinguish the 0, 1 transition from the 2, 1 and the 2, 3. But you can, you can um, you can select any any of these with the appropriate uh, frequency pi pulse, mm. um, and especially and, and so we'll, we'll place one of these transmons in a three D cavity. So we really have kind of like a cavity QED system, uh, but we, here now we have this kind of artificial atom. <clears throat> and, and there's a lot of work at, at Livermore of actually using uh, the cavity modes, which are dressed by the qubit modes, and the higher order, uh, higher energy qubit modes to get something like the equivalent of 10 or 20 qubits out of a single qubit plus cavity. Mm. So kind of getting more computational space with less moving parts. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan. So actually, I've been I, I've been, I haven't been watching the chat, but so uh, Michelle in the chat asked, uh, would this be applicable to energy systems that use renewable resources? So, um, so I, I guess it, it maybe a general question is like, is this is this connected with like any kind of renewable energy? Are there applications? Yeah, that? yeah, definitely. And for, so, so there's a big move, um, basically away from um, uh, fuel, fossil fuel, towards uh, you know like uh, uh, electric cars or, or 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 different. Yeah, kind of like using electricity instead of instead of fossil fuels for to, to power uh, a lot of our our infrastructure in in cities and. Um, the question is like like what do we make those those materials out of and that's that, that's a huge question and um, quantum computers like really offer a, kind of like a simulation platform so you don't have to actually like find those materials and do the experiments you can you can really rely on these on these simulations to narrow down the type of materials that you would use in these next generation uh, batteries and that's yeah yeah that's a that's a huge uh, research topic now. Okay, so, uh, oh, yeah, so check in the chat. Oh, so any other questions? Oh, so question from students here. So I have a question on physics. So, um, I heard that you worked on string for Nickel type of things in master's program, but you change your specialty to quantum computer and PhD or post or something? Like, was that common, changing the specialty from master to PhD? Um, it's not uncommon. Uh, actually, in, in <laughs> yeah, I guess I've, I guess I've like kind of like changed my, my focus um, a, a lot. So, so out of, uh, coming out of, out of the master's program at, um, at, 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 at Fresno, 
um, I was I was really interested in, and kind of impressed by kind of like how much uh, superconductors uh, actually kind of taught us about uh, nature in general and 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 uh, like like via the the Higgs me mechanism and these different theoretical ideas that, that we had explored at at uh, Fresno. So when I started my PhD at UT, I actually joined a group that was doing um, experiments on uh, this novel superconductor magnesium diboride. It, it, it's believed to be a BCS superconductor, but um, has a really high transition temperature of like 40K, something like that. Um, and, and, and so I was kind of on this material science direction. That project never really panned out. Then I started taking magnetic measurements of spin glasses. And then, you know, because I knew something about spin glass physics, and we were using um, a squid magnetometer. You know, because I knew a little bit about that, I got hired for this quantum computing project. And so, um, especially with quantum computing, because it brings in so many different disciplines. I, yeah, I wouldn't say if you hadn't been looking at that before, that in, in no way um, uh, precludes you from, from that uh, avenue of study. And there's really, um, I would say, there's a lack of qualified students going going into this field uh, because the field is 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 expanding so quickly. So there's certainly opportunity, almost regardless of your physics background. Okay, thank you. So any any other questions from students? For faculty. Okay, well, if not, let's thank Dan again. And Dan, so, uh, I mean, you're not that far away. I mean, uh, this is kind of an odd time, but um, if you wanted to come for a visit, uh, feel free, you know, and uh, maybe when this, this uh, pandemic uh, is over, uh, you know, or maybe we can come up and visit you. So now actually Livermore, yeah, so you, you said you're in San Jose. So yeah, it's a, a little bit of a drive to get to Livermore, right? Yeah, it's like a, you know, with, with, with without traffic, it's about 40 minutes. It's a, yeah, so it's, it's, it's long, but it's not crazy. Okay. So Gerardo, I'm sure you agree. So if, if, if Dan has, if you have time, you know, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd love to come in, uh, visit, um, yeah, after, you know, things cool down COVID wise, of, of course. Um, but, uh, yeah, and I was, you know, like going to kind, kind of reach out and, and, and share the idea, you know, if there's any, you know, if there's any space for collaboration or, you know, I know there's also, um, some kind of like paid student internships here at the lab, if you, uh, you know, like, there, 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 there can definitely be at least like an, an, an information uh, conduit. Okay, so uh, the, the thing is, if you do like uh, uh, hear or come across like student internships or summer research, definitely feel free to send them our way and we'll, we'll pass them along to the students and, and let them know. And uh, yeah, actually I wanted to ask you as far as collaboration, back on slide 12, you, you had an article by some guy Weber was that was that Thorsten Weber from from Lawrence uh, Berkeley or no? No, that was from uh, Steve 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 Weber, and it's uh, basically he um, kind of introduced this uh, qubit coupler qubit design. Okay. You know, well, okay. So I, I should probably let you go, but I, I well, actually another thing I wanted to ask about this. So in the, in this transition here. Uh, Gerardo, that was kind of like the, the evolution of the Higgs potential, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so from like the, the first one on the left, like not symmetry broken, and then you, you're tuning some parameter, I guess, and then it goes to the shallow well, and then basically now you have a, a symmetry broken state where you have, you know, uh, your ground state is on either side of like phi equals zero, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so, so what we're doing in this in this transition is changing the flux in this in this small loop here, uh, which basically changes uh, the tunneling barrier between left and right current states. 
So that's oh, the beta, the beta parameter that you're changing there is the, the flux that you're putting through that small loop. Is that it? Yeah, exactly. So so beta is kind of like a ratio of like uh, Josephson energy, which is controlled by the flux in the x x loop, uh, to like the physical, you know, geometrical and inductive energy of the of the circuit. And 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 when that that inductive energy is is dominant, basically you just have like a LC circuit. You know, and so you so you have like kind of like a harmonic potential, um, but once they become kind of equal, you know, you can think of a, I don't I don't think I had a, a picture of it of the Hamiltonian for that circuit, but basically it has like a cosine in the in the flux, and when you expand the cosine in Taylor series, it has a second order term in the flux, and these and and, and these two kind of end up uh, canceling. Uh, basically with, with the, you know, to first order and you're left with kind of like a quartic potential here. And then uh, the cosine term comes to dominate. Um, so, 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 so similar to, to kind of like a, a symmetry break, breaking uh, potential. All right, cool. Well, anyway, so uh, again, thanks for a great talk, Dan. Uh, again, open invitation if you, you know, if you find time and the pandemic is over to, to come down and visit. Oh, and one last, one more thing, one more thing. Uh, we've been recording this, okay? Uh, is it okay if we post it on our website? Or, I mean, some, some, some of our speakers, they've had proprietary stuff. And so actually, maybe you, you have some proprietary stuff in, in here, but- Yeah, let me, let me check. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually, well, uh, I, as soon as this this uploads, I, I'll send you the recording. You look over it, and then uh, you know pass it by because I know if you since you work at a national lab, you need to pass it by your bosses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they say okay and you say okay, let us know and we'll post it. Okay, certainly. Good. All right, man. Hey, have a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. Happy holidays, guys. Happy okay. holidays. And, and uh, it. We really mean it. If if you can drive over to Fresno, I think there are like a ton of questions that we would like to ask you. Probably too many for this kind of format. Yeah, yeah. I I, I would I would love to come and and certainly will. I don't know. I guess whenever it's it's, right. it's okay yeah. to, to see people. Yeah. Open invitation. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, have, I, I have to go to my next Zoom meeting. Anyway, happy Thanksgiving and and uh, okay. down here, Dan. Bye. Yeah, thanks guys.